message will begin to instruct in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. That just gets my blood pumping. I don't know about you. I just love that theme song. We're going through the book of Acts. We are seeing mission impossible, but it's made possible. We live in a world that there's a lot of impossibilities all around there. Right? I mean, you look at things, you look at, at the world around us, and we see all the difficulties. We see families broken. We see all kinds of things happening in the world. And we seem to get overwhelmed at times thinking, oh, Lord, how can this happen? How can we do this? What's going to happen? And we need to be encouraged today from the book of Acts that, that the mission that seems impossible is always possible with the Lord. Whatever you're going through today in your life, okay, if there's a, a seemingly huge hill that you can't get over, if there's something in your life that is uh, in front of you and you don't seem you can get around it or get through it or get over it, whatever it is today, be, be aware that this God that we serve is a God that does the impossible. Amen. To us it may seem impossible, to Him it's nothing. Because His strength, His mercy is infinite. Ours is limited. Last week we were finishing up the book of Acts, uh, the second chapter of Acts, and we saw that he gave us an, uh, an ingredients for the contagious church. A contagious church is devoted to the things that matter, right? As the people of God, are we devoted to the things that really matter in this world? We can be diverted, uh, we can be distracted with all these other things that are seemingly okay things, but you see, God wants us to, to focus on the things that are important in this life. He also talked about the, the fruit from that devotion. When we are devoted to the Lord, man, things happen, right? Godly things happen. God moves, and we see that the fruit is multiplied. And daily, people were added to the church, daily. Today, we're going on chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, and we're going to see the power of the people, Right, The power of, the power in the people. And we're going to see today that we are the vessel. Right, We are the vessel by which God works and moves and changes things. Anybody lose power during the hurricane? Johnny and I were talking earlier. We had a little bit of guilt because we lost power for like three seconds. But you see, we, we had power, when we finally got power at the church, they, they did some weird things. The phases were mixed up. And some things ran, and other things ran backwards. You see, the, the power came to the building, but the power was off. The power wasn't the right power, right? And we need to understand that as people. There may be some kind of power in our lives. There may be our own strength our own abilities, our own gifts. But if they're not run in God's power, then they're going to do some wrong things. There's going to be some things burn up. I learned a lot about three-phase power. We're still dealing with some of the issues because of that. But let me tell you today, if you're trying to go through this life under your own power, you're missing out. You're going to burn out. You're going to rust out. You're going to rot out because it, it's not, we are not designed to generate our own power. We are ones to be a conduit of power. Look here, verse 1, chapter 3. Now, Peter and John were going up together to the temple complex at the hour of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. And a man who was lame from birth was carried there and placed every day at the temple gate called Beautiful so he could beg from those entering the temple complex. When he saw Peter and John about to enter the temple complex, he asked for help. Peter, along with John, looked at him intently and said, Look at us. So he turned to them, expecting to get something from them. But Peter said, I don't have silver or gold, but what I have I give you. In the name of Christ Jesus, the Nazarene, get up and walk. Then taking him by the right hand, he raised him up, and at once his feet and his ankles became strong. 
So he jumped up, he stood, and he started to walk, and he entered the temple complex with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized that he was the one who used to sit and beg at the beautiful gate of the temple complex. So they were filled with awe and astonishment at what had happened to him. Amazing story. Now, I'm, I'm telling you today, there's a lot of people that read that and they say, oh, isn't that just a great story? You know, that's just a story to teach us. I believe, and I believe the Scripture bears out that this is not just a story to teach us. This is a firsthand account of a miracle that God did. You see, I believe that the Bible's true from the beginning to the end, every, bar, every part of it. And then when it says here that this man was healed fully, he had been lame since birth, then this man was healed fully. That's the kind of God we serve. He did miracles then, and he's still doing miracles today. We can trust in that. Now, if you're one, if you're skeptical about the truth of the Scripture and everything, understand, that's okay. You can be skeptical of the Bible. It's, it's skeptical of you. It's the way it works. Because the Bible knows our heart. And he knows that we will choose to go away from the Lord naturally instead of going towards the Lord. And so we see here this amazing, this amazing event that happens. The first thing we need to understand from this passage is that Jesus works through his people. Through his people. Now understand what's going on there. Get this in your mind here. Peter and John are still observing the prayer times of the Jewish people. Okay, the Jewish people had three prayer times during the day. Three o'clock was one of them. Peter and John were just, you know, regular guys. They were just going, and they were going into the temple for a prayer time. And they see this man that's been laying there since birth. He's lame, it says. Now, of course, we need to understand if he's lame, somebody had to bring him every day. Right? He's, he, he can't come on his own. He's been laying there year after year after year, after year. If you think about it, this man probably, as he begs all day, has to give a little bit to the person that brings him back and forth. He sees thousands and thousands of feet every day. Just sitting there. Can you help me? Alms for the poor. He sees them just passing by. Now, Peter and John were on a schedule. Three o'clock prayer meeting started at three o'clock. Right? And they had a place to go. They had some place to be. They had something to do. They were going to go share Christ, I'm sure. And, and for some reason, by the power of the Spirit of God in them, I'm sure if James and, and, I mean, if Peter and John had walked through this gate hundreds of times, maybe thousands of times going to prayer, and this man had been there, they'd not noticed him before until possibly this day. Have you ever gotten such a routine in your life that you go about just doing your stuff that you do, and you don't notice anything else around you? Right? I, I'm sure, you know, I got in the shower the other day, and I was, just had a lot on my mind. I was thinking about stuff. And before you know it, I'm through with my shower. And I'm thinking, did I? <laughs> did I wash my hair? I mean, did I, did I really clean? I mean, and I realized, I went, yeah, I've done all that, but I just did it because it just, it, it's ingrained in me, right? You can just turn your brain off, Right? And do those things of which you do over and over again. You don't need a lot of input from it. You brush your teeth the same way every time. You don't need to think about it. Oh, I've got to get that. Right? Don't you do the same thing? I mean, we're creatures of habit. And Peter and John were probably no different. They had walked by this man at the gate beautiful over and over again, and they had never seen him. But now that the Spirit of God lives in them, and they're walking with the Lord daily, they, they see this man. And look at how they, look, how they looked at him. It says that they looked at him intently in verse 4. The way I picture it, they're walking by him, and he's sitting there. He's not even looking up. He says, help me, please. 
And Peter and John, they said, look at us. They look at him intently. They stop. And they, they tell him, look at us. I'm sure it took him by surprise because he spends all of his time, you know, looking down and, and he looks up at them. And it says that he was expecting something from them. You see, this man, he was finally noticed by somebody. You realize that there are people all around us that we never notice? People you drive by, people you work next to maybe. I mean, just people all around us that we just don't notice. Right? They're not noticeable. They don't stand out. They're not the best at this and they're not that. And, and all these things that we deem as worthy. And these are people that, that need us to notice them. We, they, they need us to see them for who they are. And finally, I think this man looks up at him and says, somebody's noticing me. You see, the Jews were still under the law at this point, and they, they still believed that they had to give. To be a good Jew, you had to give alms to the poor. And so probably he just held his hand up. All of the Jewish people that were trying to check the box just gave him some money, walked on in, did their thing, walked out. And so it was just a transaction that didn't mean anything to anybody. Over and over again, he got money from people that didn't care to give him just because they're obligated. And finally, these two men stop and they look at him intently. And he's like, oh boy, I have hit the mother load. These guys want me to look at them. I am going to get silver and gold. This is the day that I'm going to remember. Right? And we see here that it doesn't quite go that way. Right? This is a moment that, that we need to understand in our own lives that God's assignments are seldom on our calendars. You see, when God wants us to do something, He doesn't usually put it on our calendar. He doesn't sneak at night and get into our iPhones or whatever calendar you have and say, okay, tomorrow at 4.30, you're going to have a divine appointment with so-and-so. You're going to tell them about me. You're going to lead them to me. And then it, you go about your business. Does anybody get those? I don't get those on my phone. I never get those reminders, right? Because it's always, I've got something else to do, right? And I'm going about my business, and I'm getting my stuff done, and then there is something that God reminds me about, or someone that God shows me. And I have to be willing to be diverted. I have to be willing to be distracted. I mean, this is, an this is an amazing miracle right here. And, and Peter and John, I mean, they had to go. It was 3 o'clock. They had to get there. But they were available to do what the Lord had wanted them to do. The more I understand the Lord, I think the more opportunities I miss to do His will and to see Him do something awesome. Because I'm in a hurry and I've got to do my stuff. You see, I think we could all see God do great things through us if we would just take some time and look at those around us and look, look at them like Jesus looks at them. You see, He wants us to be a people that are available. If God is going to work through His people, He does it through available and willing vessels. God will never, ever demand you do something for Him. He won't do it. Because if he does that, if he makes you do it, you're going to do it like a kid who's told to clean his, his room. Right? Tell your child to clean his room. Oh, clean my room. Oh. I like it just the way it is. I can see everything. Well, it's all in the floor. And see, that's not the kind of reaction the Lord wants. He doesn't want us to serve him under a compulsion of anger and resentment and resistance. He doesn't want that. And he, he didn't deserve that. Because he's the God of all creation. He deserves to have people say, Okay, let's do it, God. What do you got for me today? Let's go. That's the kind of people God wants to use. And he will use. And he will do it through you. But you have to be available to be diverted from your task. We can't be so focused on the things we have to do to forget about the things that God wants us to do. 
Not only are they available, but they act. Right? They not only notice him and look at him intently, but they're ready to do something. Right? They're ready to do something. A lot of people will go to the point of of being available. I'll notice that person, but if they need something, I'll call somebody else to get that for them. Right, God, if we're going to be used in, in Him to work through us, you have to be willing to not only be available, but to be useful to Him. We have made some homeless bags. Okay, it's getting cool. There is a homeless population all around us. We've got some blue homeless bags. They're from the bags that we use for guests, but we filled them with different things that, that homeless people could use. A, a mylar blanket. Right, some, some food, uh, peanut butter, and just different things that, that you can help somebody. We've got a card in there with a, stealth, with a self-addressed uh, stamp on it, and it's, it's ready. And they just have to fill out a prayer request and send it back to us, and we'll pray for them. We've got those available. And in order to just be available, we have to not only see the person in need, but we have to take it to them. Say, God bless you. God wants to provide for you. There's a God in heaven that loves you dearly. He loves you so much that he gave his only son. And to be able to act to do that. I don't know about you, but there are days that I just want to see God do something. Does anybody get those days? You just wake up and you say, God, I just want to see you do something. Right? I'm tired of the ordinary. I want to see something extraordinary, God. Something biblical. Something that's cool. And you know the response that God gives me almost every time? He said, all right, get ready because I'm going to use you to do it. And on my good days, I'll say, okay, Lord, I'm ready. And then on the other days, I'm like, okay, Lord, I've got things to do. I'd rather like to see somebody else do that. You see, if God's going to use us to do great things, he's going to do it through us. If you see what's going on, if you read the Bible and you see everything, there's not, a, a, there's not one great extraordinary thing that God just does without people. Right? As after the creation. He does the creation all on his, own, on his own. But after the creation, when people are created, He uses His people to do great things. You see, God could have parted the Red Sea by Himself. But He told Moses, take your staff, stand up, hold it up, and pray... And then I will part the Red Sea, and he did. You see, he always uses people. Elijah against his, the battle against the prophets of Baal. Right? God could have just wiped out everybody that worshiped other gods, but he chose Elijah, one man. They had a contest. Whose God is real? The prophets of Baal did all this stuff. Nothing happened. Elijah sat back and did what any good Christian did. He made fun of them. Maybe you're not crying out loud enough. Maybe your God's on vacation. Maybe he's in the bathroom. Cry out louder. So it comes his turn, and God says, okay, make the altar. Now he said, soak it with water. So he takes it, and he soaks it with water, and they dug a trench around it. They'd soaked it with so much water that the trench was full of water. And all Elijah does is, God... Show them that you're the real God. Fire came from heaven. And consumed everything. Licked up the water. Everything was gone. But he needed Elijah to be the conduit to see something extraordinary. Do you realize today that God wants you to be a part of something that is extraordinary and that could only be explained by the power of God in His people. But you've got to be available for that. You've got to be ready to act and to do something. You've got to see people like God sees people. Right? We've got to see people not for what they are on the outside, but who they are on the inside. And everybody needs God. Everybody. You see, 
We need to look with different eyes. I pray all the time the Lord helps me to see with His eyes. What if we changed the way we looked at people? What if we changed the way we thought about people? What if we cared about people so much that we'll put our desires on the back burner and we will put their desires on the front burner? That's what God calls us to do. I challenge us today. I want to see God work through us. I want to see God work through me. But I've got to be willing and available to do it. Let's pause for a second and let's ask the Lord to make us available to Him. Okay, just go ahead and bow your heads. Close your eyes for a moment. Just ask in the heart of hearts there, God, just help me to be available and ready to act for you. Now just ask the Lord, just tell Him that you want Him to work through you. God, I pray that you work through us. I pray that you work through me, Lord. I pray for each of us here, Lord, that you will use us and work through us to do things that we can't explain and, Lord, that we don't have the strength to do in ourselves. Lord, we thank you for using us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. The next thing that we need to look at from this passage is that Jesus is the power for his people. Verses 6 and 7. Now Peter said, I do not have silver or gold, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene. Get up and walk. And then, taking him by the right hand, he raised him up, and at once his feet and his ankles became strong. Now, it had been about two months since the resurrection, okay? We know that Jesus was crucified. He was buried. He was resurrected. And then we see that 50 days later came the Holy Spirit. And now this is, is within a few days after that. And so the timeline is people are still talking about this Jesus and what happened probably. But the fervor and the conversation is probably turned, since it's been so long, that has probably turned from the amazingness of it to, man, that Jesus, he was up to something good, but he's dead now. I was ready to follow that guy, but then he goes and gets crucified. And a lot of the people that didn't believe at that point had, had kind of written off Jesus as just one of those, you know, heretics, one of those crazy guys that just starts a movement, and then the government kills him for it, and there's nothing left of it. But you see here that Peter, when he looks at this man, he says, I, I'm not giving you silver or gold, but what I am giving you, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. Now, it's important to understand what's going on here. He's basically saying that Jesus is still alive, he's still at work, he's still moving among us, even though you don't see him walking the streets. Though you don't see him teaching in the synagogue, Jesus is still alive and he's still moving. And he says, I'm not taking any credit for this. He said, it's because in the name of Jesus that I say, get up and walk. You see, Peter knew that it wasn't by his power at all that this was going to happen. Because Peter had no power. He knew that. It was by the power of Christ in him. Now, one thing we need to see here, too, is that this man was wanting silver and gold. But God gave him something completely different. Do you realize that most of our desires, most of our wants are not what we really need? Those things that you want and you, 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 you long for, those, those silver and gold things or, or relationships or... Or, or money, whatever it may be, whatever those things are that you're longing for, that is not what you really need. Right? Those are symptoms. Because once you get those things, guess what? You just need more of it. And that's what sin does. Right? Sin offers you more, but it pays off very little. Because once you start having that sin, whatever it may be, 
Once you get there, you need more of it because that sin can't satisfy. Nothing will satisfy your desires in this earth. Only Jesus will. It's the way it works. It's the way He's created us. And we see here, I, have, I don't have silver or gold, but what I do have, I give you. Peter says, I don't, I'm not a rich man. I don't have anything, my own personal wealth. He said, but I'll give you what I got, which is the best thing I've got, ever had, ever will have, and it's the best thing you could ever get. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And it says here that he took him by the right hand, he raised him up, and at once his feet and his ankles became strong. Understand today that God not only wants to provide for you and your family, but He wants to provide your deepest, greatest need. And that is Him. You see, the man was just looking for a handout. But God gave him so much more. I mean, just imagine. I mean, you're sitting there begging all your life. And you're thinking you're going to get a payoff of silver and gold. And these men come and they say, we don't have any money. And he's like, oh. Dog. He'd already given up hope of trying to, to, to trying to walk. I mean, they didn't have orthopedic clinics and all of that back then. And, and if you were lame, you were lame forever. He had no hope of understanding the, the big God that was, that was about to change his life. You see, this power that God had through Peter changed this man's world completely. Completely. The man's spiritual needs were his greatest needs, not his physical needs. Understand today, whatever it is you're longing for, whatever it is on your Christmas list, right? You've got kids that the new Target catalog came, and back when I was a kid, the Sears catalog and the Montgomery Wards catalog, and you know, they're this thick, and they're every kind of toy made in China and by everywhere. And you circle those things, oh, I want this and this and this, and your kids, or you, when you're a kid, give you... I just want a hundred things for Christmas. If you can't handle the hundred, I'll take 99. Our kids are already working on their list. But you see, God looks at our list and he says, oh, that's not bad. That's pretty good. But let me give you something that's even better than that. You see, there's a power that we have in us because of the Spirit of God that dwells richly and powerfully within us. You see, we are able to do far more than we could ever do. Ever. Ever. Abundantly, exceedingly, above everything we can ask or imagine God can do. You may not think that you could ever witness to somebody. You may not think that you could ever lead somebody to the Lord. But understand, God wants to use you to do that. He wants to see you change somebody's life around you. He wants to see you to, to see families that have been broken, put back together, sons and daughters that have walked away, brought back to the Lord. He wants to see peace and joy in homes. He wants to see families that are, that are reaching out and, and loving others. He wants to see communities that come together and love each other and serve one another and help each other. And don't ask for anything in return. That's the kind of thing that God wants to do through us. But it is His power in us that can do that. If you're relying on your own power, you can't do it. And then you're going to get frustrated. And then you're going to say, ah, oh, to heck with it. God doesn't want to use me. Which is a lie from the devil. You see, God wants to use you. But all you say is, God, here I am. Use me. You know what he does? He says, all right, let's get to it. It may not be something miraculous at the beginning, but it may be helping somebody in your neighborhood. It may be loving somebody. It may be showing some compassion to people. Who knows what it is, but God can use anything for his glory. You see here that, that this man got up and he praised God. I mean, he just, he, he became strong. He jumped up, stood, started to walk and enter the temple complex, walking, leaping, and praising God. He had been changed completely. Not only his legs, but his heart. I'm sure he had been bitter as he sat there for year after year, depending on other people's hand-me-downs, thinking, why did God put me in this situation? 
I'm sure bitterness, God, he doesn't even love me. I'm sitting here, and these Jewish people just give me a little bit of money to, to, to assuage their, conference, their, their, their conscience, and, and they are just doing this. They don't even care about me. And, and why did, God doesn't even care about me. He'd do something. Has anybody ever thought that, that God's left you? Anybody ever thought that God just doesn't listen to my prayers? God's forgotten about me? He never forgets about you. Never. And here, we see through the power of God, through them, that something happened amazing. There was a seminary missions class. A missionary that had been a career missionary had come to speak to the class, and he was, he was telling them funny stories about being on the mission field. And he said that he was gifted this old car when he got on the mission field. And he said this old car wouldn't run very well. You had to kind of jump start it. You had to run, right? And you had to, it was so small that he could put a foot out the door and, and run and finally kick it in and it would start, right? So he had to determine everywhere he went how this would happen. Now, he always had a little money, and so he would get kids, right, to help push the car, right? And he'd give them a little bit of money, right? And if he could, he would, he would park on an on a incline, right, so that it would just get him going, and he could start the vehicle, right? And he had got it down. It was a perfect, he had the perfect method for this car. Well, it was time for him to go on furlough and go home for a while to America, and so he's got a missionary that comes in that's talking to him, and he's explaining all the things that he's been doing, all the, the, the ministries that he started, and these people and those people. And he says, and by the way, we've got this little car. And he starts to tell him about the way that you get this car to run, you know, and all the kids. He said, there's some great kids on the block that'll help push it to get it started. So the missionary's thinking, oh, great. Oh, yeah, sure, no problem. He says, hold on. So he goes around as the missionary's talking, and he opens up the hood, and he's looking through there, and he says, oh, well, and he starts doing some things, and he asks for pliers, and he gets it and everything. He says, well, you know, the problem is, he said, you've got some loose wires under there. And he gets in, and he just starts it right up. <laughs> the missionary looks at him like, why didn't I think about that earlier? Let me tell you today, many of you are living with a loose wire under the hood. You don't realize that the power's there. You don't realize that the battery is fully charged and ready to go to start and kick in and take you wherever God leads you to go. But you're satisfied with having to push your car, push your life to get it started. You're satisfied by having little kids push you to do something else. Let me tell you today, God's power resides in you. And as much as in you as it does anybody else as you walk with the Lord. Are you living with a loose wire? Because God wants you to live with His power flowing through you. You go on and you see what happened with this. Number three is that Jesus is glorified by His people. Verse 8, so he jumped up, he stood, he started to walk, he entered the temple complex with them, walking, leaping, and praising God, and all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized that he was the one who used to sit and beg at the beautiful gate at the temple complex. So they were filled with awe and astonishment at what happened to him. You see, when God works through us with his power, there is a great outpouring of people saying, what in the world just happened? What happened? That's amazing. That was the guy. He was there all the time. Years and years, I just walked right by him, and now he's walking and jumping and praising God. You see, any time that God flows through us with his power and we do what he wants us to, he gets the glory. He gets the glory. This guy experienced great joy. I mean, he was praising God. These people, look at this in verse 10. These people were filled with awe and astonishment. How can that be? They looked at each other. They said, how can this be? I mean, we know him. His life's been a mess for a long time. We know that marriage. How could, how could that be put together? We know them. They have been racked with addiction all of their life. How did this happen? 
I mean, we know them. That guy was rotten to the core. He was so mean. But now look what happened. That lady, she was always complaining and this and that. But now look what happened. Oh my, only God can explain that. That's the kind of things that God wants to do. And he always gets the glory. I love that the pressure's not on us. There's no pressure on you. There's no pressure on me. All we do is walk with the Lord on a daily basis. We tell him, God, you can use me. Lord, please use me. And he does. He does great things that we can't take any credit for. People's lives are changed, and he's the one that gets the glory. Todd and I pray this all the time. Right? We, we want people to come on Sunday morning and to leave not saying, oh, what a great, what a great music that was. Right? We don't want them to come and, and to say, oh, what a great sermon and what a great preacher that was. We want all of you to leave thinking, what a great God we have. Because there's no pressure on me. There's no pressure on him. There's no pressure on, on the men and women that serve up here. Because we just want to put it out there that we serve a great God. We are vessels. I'll tell you the greatest encouragement for me as a preacher is in Numbers 22 when the donkey talks. I remember that every Sunday before I get up here, I say, God, if you can use a donkey, here I am. God wants to use you. If we don't praise him, he says the rocks will cry out. You see, God wants us to do amazing things. I think we look around our country and, and we don't see a lot of miracles happening. We don't see amazing things happening. But if you talk to our missionaries all over the world, there are amazing things happening. Amazing things. I read a story from one of our missionaries a couple of weeks ago and, and they had prayed over a man that had been the breadwinner for the family and the Lord raised him back to life. Wow! You know why? Because those people were willing to let God work through them. They prayed over that man and he breathed again. You see, God is ready to see great things happen with us. There's a great story, and I'll end with this. Watchman Nee, Chinese missionary, um, incredible writer, lover of the Lord. He wrote in a book, it's called Sit, Walk, Stand. He goes and he takes a group of about seven people. And they're going to this small island south of China. Okay, it's a little island. It's about 6,000 homes. He had a contact there, an old schoolmate, and, and they had never heard the gospel. And so he takes these missionaries with him, and they go. And they get there, and the person, that the schoolmate that he had, wouldn't let them stay with them because he realized that they were going to share the gospel. And so he didn't want them staying in his house. And so they finally went through the town, and they found one man, a, a Chinese herbalist, and they led him to the Lord right there, and then they got to stay with him. Well, they began to share the gospel all around them. And they realized that this little community was worshiping an idol. This idol was called Tawang, right? It was an idol, literally an idol. And the reason that they were worshiping this idol was because every year when they had their celebration and offerings to this idol, it was the most beautiful day that they had ever imagined, right? And so they began sharing the gospel, and they get to the elders, and the elders are telling them this. Well, it's, it's because he is always taking care of our weather. Well, this one young convert that Watch Mani had led, he was 17 years old. He had been a Christian for about six months. He's witnessing to one of the town elders, and the elder says, yes, the, the next one is January the 11th. We will have our next celebration. And so that little young Christian looked at him. He says, I'll guarantee you January the 11th, it's going to rain harder than you've ever, heard, or ever seen it. Watch my knees like, did he just say that? The elders made him furious. No, get out of here. Get out of here. We'll see. The 11th, it will be the be most beautiful weather. So the 11th comes. And that morning, it was beautiful. They gathered together to start offering their sacrifices and burn incense to this idol and to start sprinkling. And then it turns into a heavy rain. 
And then it comes into a, a gully washer. And so they think, oh, well, we've made the God mad. So they put this God on a, on a stand and they take it outside thinking that if they put this God outside that it would stop the rain. Well, as they're walking out, they trip and they fall and the, the idol breaks. And so they're astounded. Many of the young people come to Christ that day. But the elder says, no, 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 that's not the truth. Your God is not God. We have obviously picked the wrong day. It's not the 11th, it's the 14th. And so they said, okay. And so the Christians began to pray, Lord, make it rain like crazy on the 14th. So here comes the 14th. Guess what? That morning, beautiful day. The Christians are praying, Lord, send the rain. Send the rain. Guess what? It starts raining. Cats and dogs. The rest of the people in the village came to Christ that day. An entire small village came to Christ when it was shown that their God was just a carving and that the real God sits on His throne. And it was the faith of that young 17-year-old convert that said, God, make it rain, and it rained. You see, that's the power of God working through His people. And God got the glory. Today, are you ready to see what God can do with you? You may be unassuming. You may think that, oh, God can't use me, but that's the ones he loves to use. Moses stuttered, and he sent him to be his mouthpiece to the Pharaoh. God loves to take people that think they have nothing to offer God and do incredible things with them. Let me tell you today, God can use you. He's ready, He's willing, He's put the power in you by the power of His Spirit, and He's ready to do great things. But it takes surrender. It takes surrender. It takes us saying, God, even if I'm discomforted, God, even if I'm put out, even if it costs me something, God, I want to be used by you. Because if it's going to be worth anything, it's going to cost us something. Today, you can't be used by God if you don't know Him. Simple as that. You may be here today and you don't have a relationship with the Lord. You've never put your faith in Him. You've never repented from your sins and said, God, forgive me. I want to follow you. Well, today's the day that He's brought you here. Today's the day that He can do that. The greatest miracle that God does is not healing not bringing people back from, from death. The greatest miracle that God does on a daily basis is to take a sinner that is bound for hell. And because of his crucifixion, his death on the cross, his paying the price for our sin, can take that dead person and make them alive forever. That's the greatest miracle that happens on a daily basis in the world, in the universe. Today, if you don't know Christ, I invite you to be one of those that God changes from death to life. And if you're a believer in Christ, I invite you. I invite you to just tell the Lord today, God, use me. I want to be used by you. Show me your power and use me. Go through me, Father. And you know what we're going to see? We're going to see people left and right being used of God. He will give you divine appointments that are not on your schedule. He will give you things to say to somebody that you've never thought of in your life. He will give you strength and motivation. He will give you compassion. He will give you a love to love those people that you don't have right now. So today, brothers and sisters, I challenge you to give yourself so that God can use you. He can work through you. He can do miracles through you as you pray and seek Him. As we get to our invitation today, I just invite you, if you don't know Christ, come. We will lead you to Him. I'm so thankful that He doesn't say, I'll forgive everything but. There's nothing we can do that God can't forgive. Amen. Not a thing. I've talked to so many people, well, God doesn't know what I've done. He does. He does, and He's forgiven people that have done far worse. Today, if you don't know the Lord, come, and we will lead you to Him.
He will save you. He will put his spirit in you, and he will put you on a path that's going to be awesome. Whatever it is today, God brought you here for a reason. He's brought you here because he loves you. He cares for you. He wants the best for you in your life and your family. And he's the only one that can provide that. Let's pray together. Father, I ask that you move in us and through us. Lord, if there's one here that needs you, I pray that they put their faith in you today. Lord, I pray for brothers and sisters in Christ. I pray for myself, Lord, that you will use us. You will use us for your glory. Father, I pray that you take over this time. That you're glorified. We see you move. We pray this in the blessed and the powerful and the glorious name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen.